take back to the Congress of Vienna, which redrew the map of Europe after Napoleon was defeated. And if you remember, the Congress of Vienna set up this German confederation right there in the middle of Europe. And it basically was a confederation of 39 separate German states. What we are going to see throughout the second half of the 1800s is these 39 separate German states coming together in 1871 and becoming this one large, powerful, strong, unified country that we all know of even today as Germany. So this presentation, and it's actually a series of presentations, will sort of take you through the unification of Germany. And really, if we were going to go back to the roots of German unification, we would have to say that it all started with Napoleon. Now remember, Napoleon brings good things to the lands that he conquered. He frees the serfs, he makes trade easier with his continental system, he abolished laws that had treated Jews unfairly. So people at first view him as this, this modern, enlightened hero. But there's one really big problem with Napoleon's rule across Europe. And that's the fact that people do not want to be French. Okay, really, you know, they, they respect Napoleon. He's not a monarch. They like some of the changes. He inspires a lot of new ideas and, and makes people see that the government doesn't have to just be a monarchy. It doesn't have to be the same as it was for the, you know, past hundreds of years. But his rule sparks nationalism. People say, you know what, we like some of this stuff, but we don't want to be part of France. And so, as you know, Napoleon is defeated you know, after he had gone out through military conquests, um, taking over parts of Europe. This last image here I just really like because it highlights the fact that Napoleon um, did take a different stance with the Jewish community. And you can see the Jewish symbols in the background of this painting, or, or you know, drawing, I guess it really is. And, you know, the idea that there is kind of inherently anti-Semitism rampant in Europe uh, in the 1700s into the 1800s and Napoleon sort of you know inspires a little bit of a different way. We're going to be looking a lot at obviously the Jewish community throughout Europe setting the stage for the Holocaust but also uh, how the Jewish community reacts to anti-Semitism even before the Holocaust takes place. So keep that in the back of your mind as well. Um, the, 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 the next kind of beginnings of German unification, aside from having this German confederation, is the fact that Prussia is going to become a leader by instituting this economic union called the Zollverein. And, you know, part of the German Confederation, these 39 separate states, they each had their own tariffs, their own customs, their own tolls as people traveled and traded. And the German Confederation was managed by Austria, or kind of under the umbrella of Austrian rule. Prussia kind of takes that leadership away by creating this economic union where Instead of the German states sort of competing with each other, they can combine forces and trade with the outside world. And, you know, it, it was actually pretty successful. You can probably debate the success of the Zollverein, but what's interesting is that we see Prussia taking the lead um, in terms of, of who is, is in charge of Germany or becomes Germany. Um, this lead is furthered by Prussia in 1862 when Otto von Bismarck becomes chancellor. And he has this kind of new, um, tough view of politics. We call it realpolitik. He would like to unite Germany under Prussian leadership, and he's basically going to do anything to reach that goal. He's ruthless. And he earns this nickname, you know, Old Blood and Iron Bismarck, as a result of a speech that he makes where he says, you know, Germany doesn't look to Prussia's liberalism, but to her power. The great questions of the day are not to be decided by majority resolutions like in 